Okay, now is the next les lesson in this uh, unit on uh, overview of big data applications and analytics. And here is a, a few uh, slides on big data trends. Uh, you will find in earlier versions of this class much longer discussions with more pictures. Here I've just highlighted a few simple ones. In this uh, slide here is actually very old, 2010. So this is a, I remember actually the talk where I first heard this in, uh, I think it was in Minnesota, and for, given by a, a, an Oracle representative. And in those days, and in fact for the next maybe f for five years, we got pictures like this, which were pretty pictures illustrating the scope and amazing size of big data and how it came from all sorts of different things. This one here mainly focuses on the commercial and um, society ones. And um, all the numbers here are obviously totally wrong. And nearly, essentially, nearly all of them, if not all of them, are actually much bigger now than they were then. And, um, but still, it's very pretty, and it just tells you what happens every minute. Flickr may be less. Flickr is not so important as it used to be. It's been superseded by less, by less specialized uh, websites. Here is a another one from around that, from maybe uh, 2014. It's from uh, it's a has a similar style of uh, of things converging in the middle, as they the deluge here were deluging on the U.S. government. And we have various things. Here we have the actual um, data um, sources. Um, notice it mentions petascale, because now we're doing exascale. And it's worth remembering that uh, exa is a, is a thousand times bigger than peta. And uh, um, zeta is a thousand times bigger than exa. So zeta is a million times bigger than peta. And here we have the light sources that are run by the Department of Energy in the US. And we have high energy physics, which at the moment is the largest source of research data. That will be superseded by astronomy when the square kilometer array comes online in a few years time. Here we have NASA and satellites. Um, here we have wearables, um, drones. NASA, NASA um, data sources, Internet of Things, genomics, more genomics, IT, this is the Cisco plot we didn't put in. So these are just another set of sources of data, and they're all big. And this one actually tells you the uh, somehow the time dependence because the numbers here a 2020 estimates, and here's 2015, and here's 2010. All right, so that's, uh, this is just, you just go, go look at this and say, these are big. And so we you just say, we agree, there is a big amount of data. But now you can't get those plots, because everybody believes there's a big amount of data, and they're no longer motivated to give evangelical or inspirational talks which needs such pretty pictures. So here's our Mary Mika, who is the author of Internet Trends, which until last year was every year. So here's 2018. We have some from 2019 later on. And here we have just some numbers about the percentage of the internet, which is 49% um, in 2017. As these are older, from older years, and those older years are miss out a year, this doesn't sound so good, we're only in 2017, but that's life. Presumably it's more like, um, probably it's more like 55% now. Anyway, it's a pretty large fraction of the world. And here we have a somewhat smaller fraction of social media. Okay. And the amazing situation is the situation with images. It used to be that images were kept in shoe boxes by people who took Kodak pictures. Now all that's disappeared, and uh, images are 
upload it directly from your from your smartphone to the to the web, and we have 1.4 tr um, trillion images uh, uploaded every year. Let's see, all over the world. And here we have the images being shared through the Instagram monthly active users, a billion. And here we have the things uh, driving this, the uh, smartphone numbers up to four, well, it's up to three billion. That's a, a reasonable fraction of the Earth's population. Here we have the uh, cellular data traffic. That's uh, certainly still increasing very rapidly. The uh, amount of places you can get good Wi-Fi is also going up and up. And the computer power stored in a smartphone is also very high. It's of course now much much larger than the, a supercomputer was maybe 30 years ago. Now here's a plot which is again was used to be prettier. These are not as pretty as they used to be. This is the amount of data and what's interesting about this data is it's zettabytes. And I've always been interested in that, because it was zettabytes actually in 2015. Uh, this is still uh, measured in a few zettabytes here. So, um, so we have this huge growth starting around 2010. It's just, and up here we have almost 160 or so zettabytes, of which 32% is structured. And um, a lot of it is actually sitting on the edge. I think about only 25% of this is in the cloud. And a lot of it is replicated, copies are made. See here, the amount of original data is not that, not so big. Although the fraction of, of original is actually um, going up as the years go on. There's a particularly a large amount of copying around here. It's this ratio of here. The hair is quite high. Okay, giant amount of data. Remember, the largest source of science data is the um, Large Hadron Collider, which is not, it's not even measured in exabytes, it's measured in 100 petabytes. Now, the, uh, yeah, the, um, and so that's a tiny fraction of the amount of commercial data. That's because there is only one accelerator, and there's seven million people. And this, and these numbers here are multiplied by people. Have a contaminant which is proportional to the number of people. Now here we have an architecture picture. Essentially, we have here our clouds and our data sets in the middle, and we have the Endpoint, which are the smartphones, the connected cars, and more broadly, the Internet of Things, or the bots, the virtual reality, the connected things, and computers. And we have here the edge, and the edge is the computing near the endpoints. So we have, imagine a, a lot, actually, these 500, over 600 hyperscale data centers in the middle, which are sort of form a network of Central clouds with up, you know, maybe there's 50 million servers in them, with up to I don't know, 100, at least 100,000 in the largest of them, probably more than that. And then we have um, on the edge we have this a huge number of much smaller systems. And again, the edge is proportional to seven billion, the number of people in the world. So it's pretty big. Here's a set of slides from this fellow, Ru, who, who has been for some time the vice president for software in uh, General Electric. And this comes from a very good talk he gave in 2012. Actually, if you look at the fortunes of GE, they haven't done quite so well according to the market. But they were pretty innovative in their software and technical vision in 2012. They got that right, but somehow they didn't implement it. They got. Um, stuck in trying to build their own systems. They should have focused on reusing other people's work. Now we talk, I mentioned the Internet of Things. Well, there's a part of the Internet of Things which is pretty interesting called the Industrial Internet of Things. 
And that's what uh, General Electric is devoted to, because it builds refrigerators or air conditioners. And those machines, which are linked to the Internet, have little, there's, there's, there are, they're effectively software-defined devices. They download information from GE Central and use that to manage themselves and do a better job. In the same way, GE uploads from those places information and uses that to understand how its devices that it sells perform. And um, so this view of, an, of a, the world as a set of intelligent network machines is quite important. The inter, that's the industrial Internet of Things. And the industrial just means these are the connection of the thing, of the devices that make the world work. And here is uh, probably a totally out of date by now. In 2012, which is when this fellow gave the talk, Twitter was 80 gigabytes per day, and the engines which GE makes for the aircraft was 588 gigabytes per day. And so this again, the, the uh, aircraft engine, like a car engine, is an example of one of these connected machines. And there's, it has all sorts of sensors on it, pouring out data. We, in the case of the engines, they get sent back to the GE cloud. They're looked at at the GE cloud, and maintenance decisions are made for when the aircraft finally reaches uh, their home. I mean, their, their um, destination airport. Okay, here we have um, uh, GE. In a little more detail about the 777, the GE90 engine, and we have 3.6 million flight records per month, and uh, each of them has 200 parameters. Uh, these numbers don't quite add up to me, so I'm not quite certain, but they're just large numbers. And I say probably what we just should bear in mind, at least in 2012, it was much larger than the amount of Twitter data. and. Um, this allows them to actually manage and actually make sure life's safer because they can identify errors because that big data comes from all their different engines. They can compare their engines and the responses of all the sensors and identify outliers. So that's this whole area of the intelligent machine is certainly a very interesting area. And um, I, I, I think it's actually not. It hasn't quite had the pizzazz of some of the other big data applications. And I think it's because there's a lot of difficult work attached to it, because there's just lots of detail. And not quite as uh, elegant as some of the other big data applications. But anyway, it's probably going to get more and more important, because eventually all machines will be put on the network, and they'll all be smart. They'll all be uploading data and downloading control and downloading the latest software and things like that. So that's uh, this is a vision which even from 2012 was uh, pretty pretty far far reaching. So I think that's the end of this discussion of big data. The next section discusses a little bit of the associated technology. Thank you very much.